This is Black Market Leadership, the underground resource for disruptors and status quo breakers. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Black Market Leadership. I am so excited. Uh, a friend of mine, Anthony Tucker Jones, internationally renowned military historian, is releasing a new book. Oh, boy. A new book called Churchill, Master and Commander, Winston Churchill at War, 1895 to 1945. And I tell you for the audience here, Churchill is just a fascinating, fascinating character in history. Uh, history. Oh, my Lord. Uh, in fact, if you were to ask me some of the great commanders, I would think, uh, I would say not just military, political commanders, Abraham Lincoln, Winston Churchill. Those are the first two who really come to my head. And now that we have uh, uh, Mr. Anthony Tucker Jones here, who has written this book, we're going to talk about the, uh, the, his new book, why it's different from just th there's so much literature out there on Churchill. He brings a new perspective. We're going to talk about the book, get into some pointers <laughs> about Churchill. But before we do this, I have to congratulate you. Congratulations, uh, Anthony, for publishing this. I just have to ask you though: is this Thank book you. number is this book number five hundred thirty five for you? <laughs> uh, it's just, it's an embarrassingly large number. Yes, <laughs> you are. I I, I got to ask. I think the audience wants to know: is you? I think you're one of the most prolific writers I have ever met. So, do you even sleep, or you just write all day? <laughs> Um, well, yeah, my brain is always fizzing with ideas, I have to say. Um, and I'm kind of at the stage of the game now where people come to me, which is really nice. Uh, you know, when I embarked on the journey of becoming an author, you have to pitch to publishers. But increasingly, they come to me and say, would you be interested in writing this? So that's very, very nice. You know, it's a good position to be in. Um, but yes, you're right. I mean, I'm interested in many, many aspects of military history. You know, it, it fascinates me. It always has done from a young age. Um, I always blame that on the fact that my father was in the military and I was born in a military hospital. So I think something must have seeped into my psyche, you know, uh, because ever since, you know, as a schoolboy, a teenager, I've just been fascinated uh, by military history. Um, you know, in recent years, I've been fortunate enough to make a profession out of it, which is very nice. Yeah, it's great. And, uh, and for the audience here, I will have a link to uh, the book. Uh, boy, this is exciting. First of all, congratulations. The cover Wow, very nice, very impressive. And the audience is going to see it now as it pops up. And I uh, just did a little bit of research. You have uh, Mr. Andrew Roberts, another famed, very uh, renowned military historian. He wrote, gave you a testimonial. This well researched, well written, and soundly argued book is a real addition to the avalanche of books on Winston Churchill. So, congratulations. You're already getting high praise as it's coming mm -hmm. out. Yes, uh, Andrew Roberts was very, very kind enough to write the forward. Um, obviously, an endorsement for him is much appreciated. Uh, the man is the UK's leading expert on Churchill. Uh, so I was great, very, very grateful for his support. Uh, and in fact, during the research process, I, I was able to pick his brain on a number of occasions. And he was, he was uh, very kind to point me in the right direction on a number of occasions. So, OK, you're a mil military historian. I get that. Oh, there's so much material on Winston Churchill. You know, I one of my one question I always ask people is, why did you start this fight? Why did you jump into? There's so much material. Uh, to me, if it, it, gosh, this seems like a huge Herculean effort. So, what inspired you to actually do this project in the first place? Uh, well, first up, Kevin, I think probably it was the most daunting project I've ever tackled. Um, you know, you look at Churchill's life and then I think, I don't know what I've been doing with my time. You know, the man crammed so much living into his lifetime and what he achieved was incredible. You know, he was a journalist, an author, a politician, a soldier, a painter, an aviator, you know, you name it. He had a go at it. Um, but one of the things that inspired me to do this book was I've written quite a few books on the Second World War over the years. And he's always been uh, he's always featured in them. I mean, he's always been a, you know, a. Um, a bit character, if you like, along with a number of the other key personalities of the war, but it was never the focus. So for me, I thought it would be quite nice to actually to make him the focus. Um, you know, he, like Eisenhower and Roosevelt and everyone else, all the key leaders during the Second World War, were sort of peripheral characters, if you like, <clears throat> in forming the narrative of the Second World War. But I just thought, you know, Churchill's actually been a constant uh, 
constant companion of mine. Um, so it would be nice to focus on him. The other thing is, it dawned on me that actually, uh, in a previous life when I used to do, or a previous career, when I used to work for the British Ministry of Defence, I spent many years in a building called the Old War Office Building in Whitehall in London. Uh, and that was the heart of the British military for many, many years. And Churchill, in fact, had offices in that building. It was built in the early 1900s. So it was a bit of a nerve centre for Britain's war effort during the First and Second World Wars. And Churchill's first sea lord actually had offices in that building. Uh, it's also adjacent to uh, Downing Street, of course, where Churchill was prime minister. It's not very far off from the Admiralty building, which, of course, where Churchill um, was first, lord, first sea lord. Um, so it kind of felt like, you know, that I was, you could feel the sort of history oozing, you know, Whitehall oozes history, the statues everywhere. I mean, there's indeed Churchill's statue in um, Parliament Square, you know, so it kind of felt he was all around me. Uh, and I say, what was obviously doing these second world, many of the Second World War books? So I just thought maybe I'd quite like to, I'd like to tackle him, have a go. Um, I got halfway through the process and kind of began to think maybe I chewed off more than I could fight, you know, because he's <laughs> such an enormous, you know, topic. Uh, you're certainly not stuck for research material. I mean, you obviously got the Cambridge Archives, and you've got a plethora of books on him that have appeared over the over the years, you know, on his on his many aspects of his life. Um, so it was quite a challenge, but I have to say, a very, very enjoyable one. I, I bet, I bet. Um, you know, as we were starting this conversation before we uh, we started recording, you, you brought up something, and, and it made me think. So, you know, I think for Americans, Churchill is. Uh, well, I mean, I'm talking in terms of World War II here. When I think of FDR and during World War II, there's, he was president. And I, I, that's, you know, he played a role in putting the right people in the place, but he, he, he was the political leader, but Churchill was both the military and the political leader, be able to uh, be able to balance. And I see that this is really what your book's about master and commander, boy, what just the weight on your shoulder on, on, you know, the weight on your shoulders to do that, to, to balance both of this, um, I, to me, it, it seems just overwhelming. Uh, well, what, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the you know, the thing when you write a book, you need a clear goal and a framework. What is it you want to say? What is it, you know, what journey do you want to take the reader on, if you like? And one of the key starting points for me was May 1940, when he was appointed prime minister, you know, and he famously said it felt as if he was walking with destiny and, you know, all his previous experience had led up to that point. And I kind of wondered, you know, was that Churchill just doing a good soundbite for prosperity's sake, you know, his place obviously was secure in history because he became a wartime leader. So, you know, and also he was the master of spin. I mean, you know, he created his own legend by word and deed. So I just wondered whether that statement actually was spin or whether there was truth in it. So I took that as my start point and actually worked backwards. Uh, and the more I examined his career, the more you realise actually he was probably the most qualified man in the country at that point, you know, to take control because he'd been, you know, he'd served as a soldier, he'd served as an officer, He'd served as a commander. He'd served as first sea lord in charge of the Royal Navy. He'd been Secretary of War, been Secretary of State for Air, so he'd overseen the Air Force. He'd been a proponent of the tank, uh, naval aviation. You know, he'd had his finger over the ears and all these pies. Uh, so actually had a really, really good grounding on how the British Armed Forces functioned, what their capabilities were, what their shortcomings were. So he really, really had a good feel. And also he'd done quite a few jobs, things like Secretary of State for the Colony. So he, he had he developed this. I mean, he had a keen interest in international affairs anyway, but he had a number of ministerial posts that, that, that gave him a feel for the British Empire. So he understood Britain's overseas interests, again, understood what our security requirements were overseas, again, what our limitations were. Uh, you know, he very rapidly appreciated one of the problems of the British Empire was it wasn't, it wasn't a continuous landmass. Of course, it was scattered everywhere. So they actually the cost of policing it and protecting it was absolutely enormous. Uh, and of course the country came unstuck when the Second World War broke out because it became impossible to, to safeguard all of it. You know, one of the things I uh, I know about Churchill is, uh, it's funny because you mentioned his his broad general knowledge. He really, you know, uh, since uh, I, I always heard a joke, philosophers and generals, they know everything in general, nothing in particular. And, you know, it seems Churchill has so had so much broad knowledge that <clears throat> it's my understanding during the war that 
he would really, I mean, he wasn't just an executive manager. He would dive into the tactics. If you're an admiral or general, he'd want to know specifics. And, and I, I can imagine a manager, you know, being in a position where the boss is over my shoulder asking these questions. I could feel like, oh, my God, I'm being micromanaged. And he had this, he really, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is he had such, a, such an understanding that he would make sure the tactics and the operations and the strategies were all aligned. They're all being correctly uh, executed as he envisioned. He wouldn't just delegate it uh, laissez-faire. Is that fair to say? Yes, you're right, Kevin. I mean, the irony is, is that Churchill, in many ways, was a bit like Churchill and indeed Hitler, heaven forbid, in that he, he micromanaged the war effort, uh, sometimes to our benefit and sometimes to our detriment. Um, Hitler, of course, micromanaged his war effort until the very end. And in fact, you know, it's widely appreciated that, in fact, that hastened the defeat did not Germany because he just would not give his generals any initiative or uh, freedom of thought or anything. You know, he, he insisted on on certain criteria. You know, he, he was obsessed with never giving ground, which, of course, stole the initiative from his generals all the time. Uh, Stalin at the start of the Second World War did exactly the same thing. He tried to micromanage the Soviet Union's war effort, again, with disastrous results. But he slowly took his foot off the gas as he began to trust his generals, like, you know, Zhukov and Mokozovsky, Koniev. You know, he, once they started winning battles, he felt comfortable in, in letting them get on with it. You know, he directed strategically the broad outlook of the war. But when it actually came to the nitty gritty of fighting battles, he left them to it. Um, now, Churchill, Mike, again, to a degree, micromanaged the Second World War uh, for a very good reason in that he'd learned early on in his career that fighting wars by committee is not a good way of getting things done and for decision making. So obviously the prime example of that is Gallipoli, for which, you know, he always bore a crossover. He was held responsible, whereas it wasn't really entirely his fault, quite frankly. But he learned from that the failure for the Royal Navy and the Army to cooperate properly, to conduct a combined all arms operation, if you like, um, and consign that operation to a miserable fate. And I think that that stuck with him throughout his life, that he knew that you had to be dynamic, you had to share initiative, and you had to take difficult decisions. If you didn't, it would end in tears. Now, in the case of obviously Britain, uh, 1940, his decision to rescue the BEF while keeping the French tweet at the same time, was a difficult decision. But what he did do was he saved the British Army. Uh, I mean, it would have been a disastrous disaster for us if we'd lost all our manpower. So he saved a lot of manpower, oversaw that evacuation. It was a defeat at the time, but crucially, in a way, honour was saved, you know, because he snatched defeat, you know, not victory from the jaws of, uh, you know, defeat, but he, he, he you know, he... he the, the disaster of Dunkirk could have been far worse. And then likewise, uh, in 1940, for the Battle of Britain, of course, he basically drew a line in the sand when everyone thought, well, the wise thing to do now is negotiate with Hitler you know, because we're on our own. Um, it would be foolish to carry on resisting. And Churchill took a difficult executive decision to say, no, we are not going to sue for peace or negotiate or make any concessions. Nazi Germany, they're the aggressor. So we're going to resist, hook, line and sinker, which of course is what we did. Uh, and then we fought the Battle of Britain, of course, quite remarkably. Um, and that greatly encouraged him. I think, obviously, for a time, he, his, his leadership was not guaranteed. I mean, obviously, to start with, his cabinet included a lot of appeasers, you know, people like um, Chamberlain and Halifax, who'd uh, all, all the time wanted to treat with Hitler. So Start with Churchill had to tread quite quickly to ensure until such a point that he, he built up a cabinet full of his own supporters. And he, he sort of took that approach to directing the war um, consistently pretty much until the end, until a number of factors changed. But of course, his constant lack of patience with his generals actually on a number of occasions resulted in disaster. A uh, prime example of that being North Africa, where the British army quite remarkably kicked the invading Italians out of Egypt. Uh, and the British army overran half of Libya. Uh, if they pressed on, they could have got to Tripoli and that would have knocked the Italians out of the war in North Africa. Instead, what Churchill decided to do was to go to the help of the Greeks, uh, which he did, which in a way, of course, antagonised Hitler, resulted in Hitler inv invading the Balkans and Greece. Britain uh, was unceremoniously kicked out of Greece. 
uh, British forces ended up on Crete, which again, the Germans invaded, so another defeat. So in those early stages of the war, you know, he took some really good decisions and he made some really bad ones. Uh, again, he was obsessed with counterattacking in North Africa and at great you know, cost and uh, shedding of blood, they, they pushed all these convoys, convoys through the Mediterranean in the, in the face of the Italians and the Germans got supplies to Alexandria, and then before the troops were kind of comfortable and, you know, trained up with them, uh, Churchill kept insisting on counterattacks, and they did that with things like Operation Battle Axe and Operation Crusader, and they all ended in tears, because again, he was constantly pushing for results. Um, and that began to change a little bit. Uh, you know, Montgomery was a general who famously stood up to Churchill, you know, um, again, for, you know, like for the Battle of El Alamein, Churchill was breathing down Montgomery's neck, get on with it, get things moving. And Montgomery famously basically said to him, you know, you know you, your job, I know mine, don't tell me how to do it. If you don't like what I'm doing, get rid of me. But basically he said, trust me, you know, I know what I'm doing. So he spent a bit more time preparing his army. And obviously, as we know, history was made because the Germans were defeated at El Alamein. But I'd say Churchill, I think, always acted with the best of intentions. Um, sometimes they had the desired results, sometimes sometimes they didn't. Uh, but that was his style of leadership. Um, you know, again, he had a very idiosyncratic way of working and he liked to work late into the night, which again was not, not terribly popular with his commanders. You know, he'd be at uh, Checkers, the prime minister's official residence or at his, at his own home in Chartwell, you know, and uh, the senior chief of staff were quite often dread when they got an invite to go to dinner with him because it meant a lengthy dinner, maybe a movie, uh, and then perhaps around midnight, one in the morning, they would get on to discuss the strategic conduct of the war and what they wanted to do, which was fine. But of course, in the morning, they all had to go back to their headquarters, hopefully with a clear head, uh, and, and run their organisations. You know, if you're Portal, uh, you know, with the Air Force, or Harris with the Air Force, you know, if you're someone like Cunningham with the Navy, or you know, the, the senior senior generals, uh, Bill and the others that were chief imperial general staff, a lot, a lot of them weren't keen on that style of management, but that's the way he worked, you know. No, I, I love that's the one thing. Uh, <laughs> there's a, uh, I, I have a story. Uh, I, I used to tell the story. I would do presentations, and um, I, I heard this. I, I heard the story. It was about. It was when Churchill and FDR met. I, I think it was in Canada, but they they met for a strategy session. It must have been for late late forty one, maybe early forty two. And they're at a chateau. The generals are there. Churchill, you know, uh, FDR works nine to five. Churchill works, <laughs> sleeps to what, uh, 10, 11 a.m. Works, uh, it works during the afternoon, works all night, just odd, odd hours. Anyway, FDR wanted to have a meeting with Churchill to actually, you know, to say hello. So he's rolling down the hallway. It must be like 11 a.m. Rolls down the hallway and he sees Churchill's room. The door's cracked open, rolls down. And Churchill is, uh, he, he sees the crack and there's Churchill naked standing up, dictating <laughs> a letter to one of his secretaries and FDR is like, Oh, Oh Lord. He turns around and he wheels and he wheels back yes. and he hears down the hallway, this booming voice. The prime minister of the United kingdom hides nothing from the president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. Mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a good story. I mean, yes, again, one of, Churchill's rather strange working habits was that he liked to do dictation while relaxing in the bath. But of course, I suppose in a way that was representative of you know a manager or a leader multitasking because he's relaxing in the bath, you know, trying to ebb away all the you know tension of the day. But but his brain, I mean, that's the thing, his brain never switched off, I don't think, you know, that he was constantly um, thinking of things, dictating memos, signals, orders. You know, so he, he had, you know, secretaries on call 24-7. I mean, they must have dreaded it, quite frankly. Um, and as it, you say, he wasn't terribly he wasn't terribly reticent about, you know, being partially clothed or naked. I mean, again, <laughs> one of his idiosyncrasies, I suppose. But um, but it but but it was but it was how he how he worked, you know. It was effective. Uh, is it true that uh, uh, Churchill wrote nearly 15 million words in his life? I think it probably is. I, I've got a, uh, I'm going like to from memory here, but I think he won a Nobel Prize, didn't he, for his writing? I mean, he, his output was absolutely enormous. You know, as you know, he was a journalist and a, and a, and a writer. 
um, because a lot of his early career, he liked to double up. I mean, it got him in trouble, but he liked to double up as a soldier and as a war correspondent. Well, these days you wouldn't get away with that, would you? Because there's obviously, you know, operational security aspects, there's a clash of interests. But, you know, Churchill, and to be fair, a number of other officers would quite happily pat themselves off on campaign with a contract from a from a paper, you know, to write up what they were doing. And now, you know, the service chiefs would throw their hands in, up in horror. And in fact, they stopped it eventually. You know, an edict came down from the war office going, officers are not to do this anymore. And of course, that was partly uh, Churchill's fault because he'd, he'd, he'd criticised senior generals. Um, but yes, he wrote a lot of books. He but also, he, um, he, again, he was kind of like a bit like a, a supercomputer in, in, in the way he worked. But he didn't have a computer. But what he did was he had an army of secretaries and researchers and a, and a vast library. So he had all these people that sort of you know, helped him with his books. Um, I don't want to say ghost wrote them because I don't think they did. But, you know, the minute he needed facts on hand, you know, you and I now would use Google or a search engine. And we'd be going, I need to check this. Is it right? Whereas he, of course, would task one of his uh, his assistants, one of his interns, if you like, and they would scurry off to the library or, you know, make some phone calls. So he he had he had at his hands this constant, um, you know, little army of helpers. Uh, another thing, of course, he did it because he needed the money. I mean, mm. he was appallingly bad with finances. Bless him, you know, he he had a rich man's tastes but very shallow pockets. He you know, throughout his lifetime. And, I, I, and again, I think there's a book actually on his, you know, how he managed his finances. Yeah. He just he just could not stop himself spending. I mean, Clementine, his wife, was scared of him. You know, she tried tried to get him to make cutbacks, but he, he simply simply wouldn't, you know, he forever owed money to his tailor. Um, but the incredible thing with his writing was that he was so popular that his, his advances were enormous. I mean, even today, um, you'd be a sharp intake of breath because the, you know, pound sterling equivalent then now would be enormous so he again i think he was a canny businessman he always secured pretty big advances for his books um i remember famously for one it was so largely insisted that he had a medical checkup obviously they wanted to protect their investment and uh, and you know and make sure that he wasn't taken ill or indeed if he was taken ill that it would not delay production of the book the more famous he became the more in demand he was as a writer or you know the easier he found it to to get his 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 project published so i'm gonna have a question about your i'm gonna have a question about your book but you, you said something that uh about you know him being a supercomputer. i i remember watching a uh, an interview with orson wells and i think it must have been in the 50s that orson wells was i think he was doing othello in england and he he was on stage acting and he could hear this mur uh, murmuring in the audience and it was churchill who had memorized the entire play in his head. He was actually reciting it simultaneously with Orson Welles. Orson Welles was blown away. So I uh, talk about a man who just can't, I mean, a voracious reader, a thinker. Um, again, I just, I just find him a fascinating, fascinating figure. And frankly, talk about purpose. You said it earlier. Here's a man who believed in his destiny, his purpose. And boy, you can see how that drove him in his career even after, you know, even after World War One, like you said, the Gallipoli campaign, I mean, that really scarred him in terms of his reputation, didn't it? It did. Yes. I mean, you know, even today he's held responsible for that. And of course, it, it caused really bad blood with the Dominion. So the Australians and the New Zealanders, of course, who famously provided the Anzac uh, Corps. Uh, and of course, popular history is that they suffered, you know, disproportionately higher casualties because obviously their populations were smaller. So the impact for them back home was much more marked than, say, with Britain. Um, I mean, I think the British and the Andacs actually lost rough about the same in numbers. But of course, you know, family-wise and culturally-wise, the impact was much greater on Australia and New Zealand. And in fact, during the Second World War, certainly made the Australians a little reticent in incorporating with the use of their troops. I mean, again, they they answered the call and they they provided divisions to help Britain fight, you know, fight the Sycamore War, as did the New Zealanders. Uh, but there are on a number of occasions where they kind of put their foot down and said, you know, we have to put Australia first. Obviously, famously, we learned, when it looked like the Japanese were going to invade, you know, northern Australia, the Australians obviously wanted their troops brought home. It was quite understandable. Um, but yes, you're right. Um, Gallipoli is, is held up as a Churchill failure. And I, I always think that's a bit unfair. The idea, the concept was his, 
obviously, while he was first sea lord, he only had control of the naval aspect. He couldn't influence what happened on the ground. Um, and also, because the navy sort of said, well, we could force the Dardanelles just using ships, which, of course, wasn't, you know, what were they going to do? Sail up to, um, you know, Constantinople, Istanbul, and put Marines ashore, and that would take the Turks out of the war. I mean, they needed physically to hold ground. But by the time all the wrangling had taken place and initial operations had taken place and they got troops ashore, of course, the Turks had beefed up their defences, they'd moved in reinforcements, uh, and of course they kept, uh, you know, the, the Allied forces hemmed in for a long time until such time as they, they decided to withdraw them. But he was held responsible for that, um, you know, but, but it, it, it wasn't entirely his fault because the army didn't really want to cooperate. They themselves showed a lack of initiative. Um, you know, the landings were botched, but then you go, well, they'd not, they'd not really figured out how to do a combined operation. Obviously, by the Second World War, you've got, you know, landing craft, bomber support, fighter bombers, you know, landing craft, landing craft with rocket launchers, you know, battleship carriers, the whole work, you know, the whole thing comes together to bring out a desired result. But of course, they didn't really have all those tactics and concepts in place for Gallipoli. So, I mean, again, it was a steep, steep learning curve. And, and as I say, I, I think Churchill learned from it. But again, it was um, symptomatic of him being a, you know, prepared to take a chance. And also he did it with the best of motives. He, he hoped that it would, of course, help break the deadlock on the Western Front and would distract, uh, distract the Germans, you know, into to, into the Balkans to obviously help prop up the Turks, which it did to a degree, but of course they never they never managed to knock the Turks out of the war. That's but I think one, um, yeah. Churchill's yeah, sorry, go on. Oh, I, I was just gonna say it, that's one thing that really sticks out to me about Churchill is that one, he's a risk, he's a cal, uh, a risk taker. I'd say calculator risk taker. He's also a big pitcher. I've really noticed that about him that he 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 uh, go big or go home, as some people say. Yeah, I can see him as as someone who is willing to take the risk. And that's why, uh, you know, from my understanding, he always had a thousand ideas and, and it drove his generals and admirals crazy. But some but, of them were good, some of them weren't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, there was always a nugget of a very good idea. And, and to my understanding, he'd always listen. He would always listen to the feedback. Yes. Yeah. The trouble they had, I think, is normally he'd already made up his mind before they told him what their views were. But, uh, but, but yeah. Yes. I mean, your point about him having a good grasp of international affairs and strategic outlook, it, it, it's right. When it came to, you know, America's emerging role in the world, you know, because by the 1930s, Churchill fully recognised that America was, you know, on the way to becoming a superpower. I mean, it, it, it's, it's industries even then, you know, from his visits to the States, he appreciated even then that America's industrial muscle would ensure that it, it, it had the potential to fight a global war, you know, even before it needed to do so. So he, he, he understood America's position. He understood what America could bring to the table. I mean, he understood that Britain couldn't fight the Second World War without it. Um, and he understood the threat posed by both Mussolini and um, Hitler. You know, he watched what the Italians did in the Mediterranean and East Africa during the 1930s, you know, with their conquest of Libya, you know, with Abyssinia. And, and how the League of Nations had done very little to stop them. Um, he'd watched how both Germany and Italy had meddled in the Spanish Civil War to ensure Franco took power. Um, you know, he watched as Germany had reclaimed all its lost lands, the Sudetenland, the Rhineland. You know, he watched them slowly expanding. And, and you know, he always said, oh, well, he was a bit of a doom and gloom merchant, you know, beating in the wilderness when he was out of office. But in fact, because he'd helped support the development of the British intelligence services, during the 1930s, when he was out of office, they actually kept him well informed. So he was fully cognizant of, you know, the Germans developing tanks on the quiet, which they ironically were testing in Russia. You know, they said, oh, they're agricultural tractors. But, you know, he, he knew that they were building tanks with an eye to the future. He knew they were building submarines with an eye to the future. He knew that they were building a Luftwaffe. All of this in defiance of the you know, Treaty of Versailles, which had banned them you know, basically from building up the military spec. So he fully understood that. What I found quite surprising when I was researching the book was his lack of grasp of the threat posed by Japan. Really? You know, because Yes, because, you know, during the 30s, as you, as you probably know, the Japanese were on the rampage in China. You know, they gobbled up Korea and they carved out this enormous puppet state uh, in Manchuria. You know, they created Manchukuo, which was administered by the, by the Japanese. And um, 
Churchill seemed to think they were a force for good, which I found quite surprising that he felt, you know, China in a way because of the chaotic state it was in was actually a danger to the community, you know, because it was driven by warlords and the communists and civil war, that it was this enormous country, but it was prostrate and in a terrible, terrible, terrible state. And of course, largely dictated to by the Western powers who had all these concessions. Um, and he thought actually the Japanese you know, what they were doing wasn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, to his shame, he, he didn't, he didn't um, criticise what they did in Shanghai or Nanking. So he, he, he got that wrong. Of course, subsequently paid the price when they attacked Britain's colonial interests in the Far East and obviously famously, uh, to his shame, captured, captured Singapore. So I was quite surprised. I don't know whether he, he genuinely believed that they, not that they were a force for good, but maybe that they were stabilising, you know. Um, I think, or, 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 or whether he was sticking his head in the sand. You know, he didn't want to face up to reality. And the problem, of course, Britain had was going back to America being an emerging power. By the sort of mid to late 1930s, Churchill fully appreciated that Britain could not fight the war on two fronts because a long time, for a long time, we'd maintained this two fleet policy that we could fight naval actions anywhere in the world, uh, you know, at the same time. But by the 1930s, our resources were so increasingly strapped that he, he, he recognised that we were going to have to prioritise somewhere. And of course, ultimately, that priority became the Mediterranean and, and Europe. And uh, British Far Eastern interests obviously lost out with, you know, for a while, quite catastrophic results. If you like this content and want to hear other things like it, head on over to the website at blackmarketleadership.com. That's blackmarketleadership.com. There you can subscribe to the podcast and you can even create a free member's profile. 